сейчас на сцену буду звать человека, который последние 12 лет, если я не ошибаюсь, я не должен ошибаться, последние 12 лет работает э, очень много в Африке. И это э, самые, сложные, самые сложные темы и самые чувствительные вопросы, которые мы можем только себе представить. Э, она будет рассказывать про свою работу там. Это Гленна Гордон, фотограф, обладатель World Press Photo 2015 года, как раз за свой проект, связанный с похищением девочек группировкой Бока Харам в Нигерии. Гленна. Hi, uh, my name is Glenna Gordon. I'm a documentary photographer and photojournalist. Uh, I first went to Africa in 2006, so, so you're correct, about 12 years. <laughs> and uh, I thought I was gonna stay for six months and I lived there full time for eight years and have worked there continuously ever since. Um, I never planned to go to Africa and so I didn't have this expectation of being a war photographer or being this kind of photographer or that kind of photographer. I just fell into it, so um, once I was there, I, I knew that I wanted to do something different, and 
I first went to Nigeria after I'd been living in Uganda and Liberia, so I'd already traveled to a lot of different places, and uh, Nigeria is one of the, it's the biggest country in Africa by a lot of measures. One in five Africans is Nigerian. Uh, other than South Africa, it is the biggest economy. And so when I went there, I wanted to do a story about the economy and the scale of this place. And I thought I would do this big project about infrastructure in Nigeria. And I had this idea to do this like little side project about Nigerian weddings. Um, in the end, I never did the infrastructure project and I just crashed dozens and dozens of Nigerian weddings. Um, but it was, a, it was a really good training ground for me because I would ask people, hey, do you know of any weddings this weekend? And they'd be like, oh, I went to one last weekend. And I had to ask so many people and eventually I learned how to find weddings and I also learned how to ask people for things. Once I got to the weddings, I would uh, meet the bride and groom and I would meet their parents and ask for permission to be there. And uh, the great thing about being at a wedding is that everybody looks really good so everybody wants to be photographed. So it's not like when you're photographing a tragedy, there's a lot of issues and you have to be very sensitive and you don't want to add trauma onto somebody who is already traumatized. When you go to a wedding, everybody's like, yeah, snap me. Um, so it's a very different experience. Um, I wanted to show Nigeria's economy, so I, was, so I was going to very fancy weddings in very opulent places, but I also went to, you'll see some weddings that are clearly not of rich people. And so it became a lens for me to talk about issues of economy, issues of gender, issues of religion. I went to Christian weddings, I went to Muslim weddings, I went to all kinds of weddings. Um, this picture that's on the slut show right now, this was a, an early wedding I went to, and this is a gift given out to all of the guests. It is dishwashing detergent, and you can see that it says happy married life, and uh, the date there, and it's, it's from, I think, one of the aunties. And so, and this became one of my favorite pictures, and this is one of the first times that I thought about photographing objects. Um, I'd already been working in Nigeria for several years when news hit that uh, more than 200 girls had been abducted by Boko Haram. And I had planned to go to Nigeria to work on another story at that exact moment, and I immediately scraped all my plans, and I, I wanted to do this. Uh, it was a pretty viral story in the media, and I had a lot of editors emailing me saying, um, please go cover the protests. Uh, Nigeria is often a place where people feel that they can't fight the government, they can't protest, they can't speak up, that their voices don't really matter, and they just wanna, they just wanna have their daily bread and not really worry about what's happening politically. But just as the story of the schoolgirls touched a thread internationally, it also touched a thread at home. And so people were protesting, and so editors were like, please go take pictures of these protests. And I, I just knew that wasn't what I wanted to do. And so I turned down a couple of assignments. Uh, I still went to the protests, but I went with a very different goal in mind. Um, that time, it was extremely dangerous to go to the village of Chibok, where the girls were from. It's near the border of Cameroon and Nigeria, uh, in a very remote area. Uh, Boko Haram controlled that area at that point. And uh, in the end, I, I did end up going to Chibok a couple of years later, and even then, it was really dangerous, and I was like, what did I do this for? Um, uh, when I was at the protests, I was in the capital, Abuja, where there are many people who are from Chibok living there. And so I used my wedding skill, and I went up to one person after another, and I was like, hi, I'm Glenna, I'm a photographer. I want to do this thing. And often, often people are quite polite. So I'd say, hi, I have this idea. I really want to get in touch with parents of the missing girls. Is there any way you'd be able to help me with that? I want to photograph some of their belongings. And uh, actually, in the north, uh, because people are so polite, no one will ever tell you no. They will say, yes, yes, call me tomorrow. Um, or they'd say, like, yes, next tomorrow. And uh, because I'd already gone to so many weddings and I'd already asked so many people for things, I was able to see the difference between, like, a real yes and a no yes. 
And so I just went from person to person and protest to protest. I kept trying. And finally, I met a guy named Sunday Samuel. And I was like, this is what I want to do. And Sunday was like, oh, let me call my brother. He's in Chibok right now. And I was like, you're my guy. Uh, Sunday was a great connection. His father is a pastor in the town of Chibok. So he's well-liked and well-known locally. And so when his brother started helping me out, we were able to do quite a lot of work. Uh, it was logistically extremely complicated to make this happen. I was in Abuja, the capital, and his brother is in Chibok. There's very little cell phone service in Chibok. His brother would have to go stand on this one particular hill at a particular time of day for us to call him. But eventually, his brother helped me collect a lot of different things. They sent them in a local taxi from Chibok to a major city in northern Nigeria, then put them on a bus to Abuja, where Sunday picked them up and brought them to me in a photo studio. These are dresses that were worn by the Chibok girls. Uh, they were handmade. You can see that they're all quite different. They were made by their mothers. Uh, the girls went missing so suddenly that, you know, they hadn't washed their clothes necessarily, and the clothes still smelled like them when we were in the photo studio. These are some of the girls. The girl, uh, their parents sent all sorts of different things, and in the end, I, felt, I ended up feeling like I had quite a real connection with one of the girls. Her name is Dorcas. She's in the purple headscarf um, on your right. This is a little note that was inside somebody's notebook. At the top it says, no need of address. Hello, my in-law. How are you and how about your school? Why do you give me this exercise book? I thank you so much. Have a nice day. When the girls first went missing, um, it seemed like they would come back any moment. It didn't seem like they were gone forever. Uh, the plot has a lot of twists that have continued to this day and some of them are still missing, and some of them have been returned. But for a lot of them, these are their last words. This was a, one of the girls' dresses. The sleeve was so small, you could tell that she probably didn't weigh more than 90 or 100 pounds. Like, she was just a slim, tiny little girl. This is Dorcas's your notebook, the one who was in the purple headscarf. Uh, it had the Eiffel Tower on the front of it, and I always wondered if she knew where that was. This is the front cover of her notebook. It's got hearts on it, just like all of you probably drew when you were teenage girls. Inside the notebook, at first we couldn't really tell what it was, but there was this back and forth, and eventually uh, one of my colleagues, a Nigerian woman I was working with, figured out that what happened was there were little notes like these that Dorcas was exchanging with a boy. But Dorcas didn't want to lose them, so she recorded all of them in this notebook, in this back and forth. And so there are love notes between Dorcas and a boy. And my favorite is number 12, where he says to her, hi, the remote control of my life. They sent me dresses and clothes. Because the girls lived in dormitories uh, and they all had the same items, a lot of their clothes had their names on them, so it was easy to know whose was whose. Uh, this is Hawa Muta's PE shirt, like her uh, exercise shirt and her exercise skirt. This is Maggie student's shoes. Uh, Maggie had already lost two of her brothers to Boko Haram and was from another village and was sent to Chibok by her mother because she thought it was safer. Somebody's earrings. Hawan and Kati's notebook. Here's another really great letter. At the top on the right it says, no need of my address, my address is greeting. Dear brother in Keki, millions of greetings go to you, thousands to your friends, zero to your enemies. This was another notebook that I got that has a drawing of the universe that they had uh, 
done in science class, Boko Haram's name translates to Western education is sinful. Uh, Boko means copy or book, and uh, they're opposed to all forms of Western government and Western learning. They are an Islamic jihadi terrorist group, and they have since aligned themselves with ISIS. So from these objects, I really felt like I got a sense of who these girls were. This is somebody's notebook where she's listing her friends, and she's, she's ranking them. Some of them are good. Some of them are stupid. Marta is stupid and wrong. And Hawa is on top table, which means like the very best. This is uh, another notebook that on the right it says Wakaki, and Wakaki is uh, Hausa for song. And eventually I had this translated, and it's a song about how men should treat women better. And you'll see here on this other side, there's some sort of drawing that she scribbled out. To me, it looks quite uh, like somebody's anatomy, some, like a human body. And, yeah. Hello? Is this better? OK. So she's sing writing a, the lyrics of a song that are about how men should treat women better and probably drawing a picture about something bad that had happened to her. Uh, we will never know because she's one of the girls who is still missing. I asked families to send me anything that they could spare and I didn't really know what I would get, but somebody sent me a toothbrush. So I photographed a toothbrush. Elizabeth Joseph's notebooks. Uh, this one is one of my favorites because it's a, like a social science or a political science notebook, and it has the, on the bottom part here, it says, government. The word government suggests different things to different people. When we use the term Nigerian government, we usually mean the sum total of the people and the institutions that make and enforce law within Nigeria. And clearly the Nigerian government has failed these girls. What is a miracle? Most of northern Nigeria is Muslim, but the small town of Chibok actually was the center of a Christian missionary group for many years, so it's actually a very Christian town. And uh, part of why I think this story was so viral and resonated for so many people was it's the story of these Christian schoolgirls who are kidnapped by these Muslim jihadis. And, uh, there are a lot of reasons it went viral, and that, that's among them. And that plays into the conflict in Nigeria, which is largely between North and South. Part of the reason that Boko Haram exists is because the southern part of the government, which is Christian, has always neglected the North. The North has never had the same sort of schools, hospitals, or resources that the South has. Most of the oil money has stayed in the South, and the North has very few economic opportunities for young people. And when young men have nothing to do, they're much more likely to be able to be recruited for the equivalent of a couple of dollars. Um, the story continued, and I think that we also have to look at the role of journalists in the media and how they affect the story. Uh, my pictures went viral. They were published in many places. I won a lot of prizes. People flew me all over to talk about the girls. But at the end of the day, I question how much they helped these girls. And for a long time, uh, it was really difficult for me to know what to say when people were like, where are these girls? When are they coming back? People cared so much about these girls, but the problem is that Boko Haram kidnaps tens of thousands of children people really care about these schoolgirls. Um, fast forward a couple of years. Uh, just last year, the Nigerian government, through intermediaries, paid a ransom of three million euros to release about 80 of the schoolgirls. Uh, three million euros in a place like northern Nigeria buys a lot of suicide bombs. The conflict is worse than it has ever been. Uh, when I was there last November reporting on this story and I went to Chibok, I had a lot of close calls 
because suddenly there's such a spike in violence. And why has that happened? Because Boko Haram has this new injection of cash. So at the end of the day, covering this story and the way this story went viral has actually contributed to the conflict. Um, it's not something journalists like to talk about, but I think that it's part of storytelling for us to think about the consequences of our actions. Because we all cared so much about these 200 and something Christian schoolgirls, including me, uh, the Nigerian government was forced to act. But I think we need to ask the bigger question of what if we cared about all of the children who were kidnapped by Boko Haram? I've done other stories about boys who are kidnapped and families who are kidnapped and none of them have ever gone viral. Only this one has. Uh, in the end, uh, Dorcas was not released. Her mother is uh, one of the main activists who is still trying to agitate the Nigerian government, or she was at that time. And uh, when the 82 girls were released, Dorcas was supposed to be number 83. Uh, they think that she was held back because of her mother's activism. Her mother is no longer active and didn't even want to talk to me when I was in Nigeria the last time, and I've visited her every time I've been there. Um, I still hope to one day find the boy who called her the remote control. I know that his name is David, and he lives in Lagos, and uh, Dorcas's sister, who is in school in the center of the country, knows where he is. Um, when I was there last time, her mother was so upset that I knew it was not the right time for me to push for that story, but I do hope to go back one day and find him. Um, I could show you photos of dead kids and a military invasive invasion, but that's actually not what I'm really interested in doing as a storyteller. Uh, those are pictures, you know what those look like, you've seen them before. I'm more interested in showing something, you something you've never seen before. This is a portrait of a woman named Farida Ado. She is a romance novelist who lives in northern Nigeria. So in the midst of a situation where there's a giant conflict and uh, there's a group that opposes Western learning, there's also Muslim women who write romance novels. Uh, the very first time I was going to northern Nigeria, uh, I asked a colleague, what should I read? And I was going there for a mass wedding as part of the wedding project that I showed at the beginning. And she was like, you should read this book called Sin is a Puppy That Follows You Home. And it's by a Muslim woman who writes romance novels. And I was like, what? That sounds amazing. I'd never heard of anything like that. And so, of course, I wanted to go and meet them. Uh, the woman who told me about them was like, well, most of them aren't going to want to have their foot picture taken. It's very taboo. And... Uh, you know, it's still a very patriarchal culture. And so, like, for example, Farida, her husband doesn't mind that she writes novels because she can write novels at home. He would never let her have a job outside the house. But because it's somehow considered still, like, women's work, it's acceptable in this context in northern Nigeria. When I set out to do that story, I actually began this before the girls were kidnapped. Um, how do you do a story that's about literature? And I had, and most of the women write their stories in these tiny little composition books. And so I had actually already been photographing notebooks before the girls were kidnapped. This is uh, some of the covers of the books, all tied up for sale at the local market. There's um, Bollywood, uh, movies from India are extremely popular and they influence the local industry as well as these books. So you might see that these women don't exactly look Nigerian, um, and that is the influence of that factor. The book Sin is a Puppy is actually available in English. You can even download it on your Kindle, published by an Indian publisher in a South-South literary exchange. This is a woman named Rabi Tale. Uh, she was one of the first people I met on a sort of magical afternoon in Kano and I showed up and Robbie was about my age and she was feisty and she had been engaged to a man whose family broke off the engagement because of her writing. And then there she was in her early 30s, which makes her uh, like a spinster in northern Nigeria. And, uh, but she was not really willing to give up her writing. 
she had a couple of options of suitors at that moment. None of them were as good as the person who had originally uh, wanted to marry her, but she was going to marry somebody. Um, so one of them was a lawyer, and one of them was a publisher who worked for the state. And she said she didn't want to marry the lawyer because lawyers only make arguments. They don't tell the truth. And so she did work outside the house. She's from a much more liberal family. So this is the courtyard of her office at the Ministry of Information, where she works and she like translates uh, children's books and makes other educational materials. This is the bedroom of a young girl named Farida Ado. Oh, sorry, <laughs> no, uh, Firdausi. Firdausi. Farida was the first woman. Uh, Firdausi is a middle class girl or an upper middle class girl. Her father was a bank manager and he gave her pocket money every week to go to the market and buy books. And I met her at a meeting for an association of Nigerian authors. And she's this like 16 year old girl. And I was like, what are you doing here? And she's like, what are you doing here? <laughs> um, we became good friends and we've kept in touch. She is now in law school and still writing novels on the side. Uh, the most amazing part of this to me was I'd worked in maybe 25 countries in Africa, and uh, I'd never met a young girl who wanted to be a novelist before. And I think for the most part, that's because they don't have role models who are novelists. Whereas in this area where there's this rich tradition of women writing novels and writing romance novels, it was a possibility for her. It was something that was within a realm of what she already knew. This is Robbie with her suitor, who she did later marry. Um, Northern Nigeria is an incredibly conservative place, so men and women can not really socialize unless there's somebody else there. Uh, but because I was around, I could chaperone. And so they actually were able to spend more time together when all of us hung out. Uh, and it was a really unique opportunity for me to have a very intimate connection with Robbie and to see this budding romance. Um, here he has brought her some fruit called Agualuma, and uh, this is a really special gift because Agualuma are only in the south of Nigeria, and he had purchased them at a very high price to bring to her, and we, we all spent the afternoon eating them and hanging out in her room. Most of the books are about love and marriage and courtship, and because I had already been photographing weddings, I continued to photograph weddings. I wanted to show not just the authors and the book industry, but also a little bit of what life was like in northern Nigeria. Um, so when I first went, I went for this mass wedding, and I thought there would be a 1,000 women and a 1,000 men in the same room. Uh, but really, the weddings are very segregated. Women stand on one side, men stand on the other side. So you can see all of the boys over here and some of the ladies starting over there. Uh, this is a bride who told me she was 18 but they all tell you that they're 18. Uh, this is a woman named Jamila Tanku. She is a journalist, she is a radio reporter, and she also writes novels. Uh, she's married to another journalist and all of her daughters are going to college. So even amidst this intense conflict about Western learning and Western education, there is a city where all of these girls are writing and going to school. Um, when I made a photo book of this work, I ended up calling it Diagram of the Heart. A lot of the novels have the word heart or love in their title, and I had seen this drawing outside of a school in Kano, and uh, a, a doctor friend of mine told me that it's not anatomically correct. Um, I don't know if there are any doctors here who can verify. But uh, it, to me, this was so symbolic because all of these schools were closing because of Boko Haram and yet all of these women were still taking their work to heart and taking it very seriously. Some of the best parts of these books were the covers. They're done by a local artist, and so some of them look like those Bollywood covers that you saw at the beginning, and others are these like extraordinary drawings. And uh, a lot of the books, some of the books are quite subversive, and they're about women's rights and about uh, child marriage and human trafficking, 
and others are quite conservative. They run the whole gamut of political ideology, uh, just like romance novels might here or anywhere else. Uh, one thing that I struggled with when I published this work was a lot of outlets wanted to syndicate it and they would be like the subversive women who are fighting the dominant paradigm and that's not quite right either. A lot of them were writing books about how you're supposed to please your husband and accept it when he beats you. Um, our stories are complicated and we want heroes and we want Christian girls kidnapped by m bad Muslim men. But life is so much more complicated than that. And my goal in my work has always been to tell the stories that are in between those poles. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, мы, переходим к, uh, мы переходим к вопросам. У спикеров очень много вопросов. Мы с них тогда начнем, а потом перейдем. Да. Алина, вы пока отправляетесь туда, наверх, а начнем с первого ряда. Да. Thank you, Glenna. That was beautiful. Um, one question I have is, how do you deal with the trauma of reporting on so much trauma? I got a dog. <laughs> um, my dog is like, that's actually one of my main answers. I, I did get a dog and I really love my dog more than anything. Um, you know, <sighs> There's, especially in the US right now, there's this culture of self-care and wellness as if you can just like do a face mask and make it all go away. And uh, I don't really find that to be the case. Uh, I love my work and I find the best way to deal with it is to do more work. Um, because if I just sit around and uh, mope in my trauma, I'm not actually honoring the people whose stories I'm supposed to be telling. Uh, I feel when I'm the happiest when I'm working and I'm fired up about a story. When I was working on this story about the romance novelist, like nothing has ever been, nothing before that had ever been as important. I had so much fire in my belly and I was just like, let me tell you about these women who write romance novels, like everywhere I went. I think all my friends were sick of it by the time the book came out. But um, yeah, I think that the best way out is through. And I know that's a simplification, and uh, I mean, it's also avoiding the answer because I don't know, I'm still dealing with it. <laughs> um, how do you, um, I guess you've probably been doing this your whole career and you answer this question a lot, but how do you convince people to have their photos taken? Um, I'm never gonna photograph somebody who doesn't want me to photograph them. I think nobody owes me anything, and uh, I don't, if somebody says no, I'm not, my job is not to convince them to say yes. There are certainly situations where my work is for the purpose of implicating an actor, a bad actor, and then if there's a public situation, that person in my mind has lost their right to refuse. But in any situation where there's trauma or where I'm entering somebody's home, I'm not gonna go somewhere that I'm not welcome. Um, especially in northern Nigeria, if I'm in somebody's home who doesn't want me to be there, it's very dangerous for me to be there. Um, there's, there's, in addition to crime, there's also kidnapping. And uh, that is one of my biggest fears as a journalist. So the main way I do it is by only being with people who want me to be there. And then how do I, how, the way that I do that is, you know, I am except I try to be as polite as possible and as respectful as possible. Uh, when I'm in northern Nigeria, I'm gonna you know, dress appropriately and cover my head. I know how to speak a little bit of Hausa, which is the local language. I mean, I don't really know Hausa, but I know enough to do, they do very extended greetings. So they'll be like, hello, how are you? How is your family? How is your village? How is your health? How is your house? How is your mother? How is your father? And if you do that for a few minutes, then people are so happy that you have learned part of their language and they open right up to you for the most part. And then they will say, oh, you speak Hausa. And I'll be like, nope, Hausa's finished. But by then I'm already in. Um, the other thing that I tend to do is I carry a small, like four by six uh, photo album of my photos that I show people so I can show them I've already been, I've gone to all of these weddings and I've photographed all of these ladies and, you know, they'll like the photos and they'll be like, oh, okay, you're not trying to just, 
you know, sell my picture t to some website and make a lot of money. You've been here for a long time. That being said, there's still a lot of resistance and there are a lot of people who don't want to be photographed. I mean, when I was working with the novelists, um, the ones who are from much more conservative families, their husbands would not agree for me to photograph them. And, you know, all I can do is respect that choice. I'm never going to convince somebody who doesn't want to be photographed to be photographed. Uh, I work with the people who want me to be there. And, you know, I often form quite close relationships with people, uh, like the woman Robbie. I spent so much time with her. I knew everybody in her family. She, we'd chat on WhatsApp when I wasn't around. And, you know, when it comes to, like, the schoolgirls stuff, um, it helped that I was working with this guy named Sunday who was very respected in his community. So that's the other thing that I find to be very important is that whoever I'm working with has to be somebody who is respected by their community. And because he's the son of one of the biggest pastors in this town of Chibok, uh, I was able to get very good access through him. <laughs> Anyone besides my friends? <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of questions from... Okay. Uh, у нас очень много вопросов от okay. спикеров. Uh, I, I said that we have a lot of questions from speakers. <laughs> so, uh, last one, and then we will go to the audience. Okay. Uh, Glenna, it sounds... A, a lot of the projects that you are showing us today seem like they took a long time to do, and a lot of relationship building. And I think to get to that place, obviously you had to... Um, you had to gain the trust of a lot of people, but you also had to trust a lot of people who maybe weren't even figures in your story, but fixers or mm -hmm. security people. Yeah. How do you uh, negotiate a, you know, a personal sense of security in a place like northern Nigeria? Uh, very carefully. <laughs> um, I'd like to think that, you know, Nigeria is a very tough place. I would never have wanted to start working in Nigeria. When I began my career, I began my career in Uganda, and Uganda is a very safe place, and people are very friendly and very open to outsiders. And I'm very glad that I learned how to operate in that context somewhere that was safe. I, you know, other journalists who began in Nairobi, who began in Sudan, like, I don't know how to, how I would have gotten my, my legs on in the same way. Um, by the time I got to Nigeria, I think I already had like a pretty good radar of when somebody is trying to take advantage of me. Uh, <laughs> I was telling a story earlier today about fixers who I have fired. I don't like working with all people. And uh, when I find somebody I like working with, like I will hold on to them and I will treat them as well as I possibly can. And for me, I think the best thing I can do to keep myself safe is to have everybody who is around me invested in my security. So. When they care about me, they want me to be safe too. And I have to do that by caring about them. So I will spend a huge amount of time with my fixers. Uh, like my favorite fixer in Northern Nigeria, I, I know his mother, I know his sisters, I went to his sister's wedding. I went, um, you know, I, whenever I have spare time, I visit their family house. And so that guy thinks of me like his little sister. And so he's going to do everything he can to keep me safe. And he's uh, invested in keeping me safe. And, you know, sometimes I'll push things with him. I'll be like, let's stay 10 more minutes. And he'll be like, no, we have to go right now. And if he says that, I'm out of there. So you, so you have to trust the people you work with, but you also have to build that trust. Like with this guy who I'm talking about, the first time we worked together, I took it really easy. We just walked around the street. We walked around this area where kids were playing. And he was doing this like really great job of talking with people and helping me meet people and introducing me to people. And he was just sort of a natural. I was like, this guy is great. And so from there, we started to do harder and harder things because I trusted him and because I was able to build trust with him. Um, other than that, I would say I do always have insurance. Uh, I also do security checks. I have hostile environment training. I have done basic first aid trainings. Um, and uh, I always do security assessments before I go on any trip. I will say, okay, this is the thing I want to do. I accept the risk that, I've d that I'm going to do this thing. How do I minimize all risk around my decision to do this thing? Uh, Glenn, thank you very much for sharing all your stories and pictures with us. It is obvious that you're a brave and strong woman. Um, but still, coming back to the safety, 
of your safety. Uh, based on my experience, I've spent two days in Lagos, <laughs> not voluntarily. So in, when, when we arrived to the airport, straight from the airport, we've been escorted with the military to the hotel. And that was a time when the Ebola virus was spread around the West Africa and the um, Boko Haram, they kidnapped again hundreds and hundreds of people at that time. They were kidnapping. And uh, we've been strictly prohibited to leave the hotel. And the hotel was like the island. It is sad to say, but it was like the island in the ocean of poverty. So the question is more about your situational awareness and your safety. Uh, were there any situations when you felt that your life is in danger and how you, if yes, how you've managed to um, survive? Um, well, first of all, there's, uh, I, don't, I don't know why you were in Lagos or who got you with a escort to the hotel, but uh, Lagos is a city that has a lot of crime. So in Lagos, somebody wants to steal your phone and maybe if they're gonna kidnap you, they're gonna try and extort some money from your family, but it's not ideological. Boko Haram is gonna kidnap you for ideological reasons and as a bargaining chip with the, with the government. Like, uh, I'm a big target for Boko Haram. In Lagos, somebody's just trying to rip me off. So the threats are different. So first you have to know the difference between what is your risk. In Lagos, your risk is criminal. In Northern Nigeria, your risk is ideological. Somebody is highly unlikely to steal my phone in northern Nigeria, but they're highly likely to steal my phone in Lagos. So part of my situational awareness is knowing what is my risk where. Um, one of the times I felt most at risk was I was walking in Lagos from where I was staying to the grocery store, and there was a guy, and it was a very busy street, and there was a guy who was just sort of following me, and he wasn't quite right, and at one point he tried to grab my arm and like pull me into like like an alleyway and I started screaming and all these people got involved and like, uh, and it was fine. But you know, that's a situation that could have gone differently and that's not like, I wasn't doing something dangerous. I wasn't reporting on Boko Haram. I was walking a five minute walk from my house to the grocery store. So, you know, risk, risk is not always what we expect. Um, that being said, there are other times I felt quite at risk um, from more real elements, this trip that I did uh, to northern Nigeria to follow up on the Chibok kidnapping, uh, the situation was really bad. So I've been to northern Nigeria dozens and dozens of times. I feel quite comfortable there. And when I showed up on the ground last November, it was a totally different situation because Boko Haram had this new injection of cash. And there were bombings every day. Um, so... At that point, you reassess your plan. You're like, okay, things are less safe than they ever have been. How do I change my actions? Uh, I mean, and then after that, it's, it's, it's a lot of luck. Uh, the first afternoon on that trip that I was in uh, Meiduguri, which is the city at the epicenter of the conflict, I had planned to go to this area on the outskirts of town called Muna Garage, which is like a refugee settlement. And... Uh, there's a strict curfew because you can't move at night. And I was in an interview and it was like going long, going long. And by the time we finished the interview, it was maybe like 4.30 and I was like, okay, I don't have time to go to Muna Garage today. I have to go tomorrow because of curfew and because it's not safe to move at night. That night, there was a massive suicide bomb in Muna Garage. So if my interview had ended half an hour earlier, I would have been in that place. Uh, I did go to that place the very next morning and, uh, you know, when I photographed some of the bodies being cleaned and some of the funerals processions that were happening. And that was a situation where, um, like, literally the way that a viral media story that I contributed to, to made me less safe in my subsequent work and has made northern Nigeria less safe. And the most important thing to remember is that, okay, I'm at risk one day, uh, I'm in northern Nigeria for on that trip two weeks. The people who I'm working with face that risk every single day. And they live that day in and day out. And keeping that in mind makes it feel like a little bit less in crazy to do these things because everybody lives their life. You have to live your life. When you live in a war zone, you still live your life. Um, and then I, you know, again, I work with people I trust. You know, if I had been somebody who had been like, oh, curfew doesn't matter, I'm still gonna go to this area, 
I would have been there when it happened. But because I respected curfew and I respected the requirements of my security plan, I didn't go. So it's both luck, but it's also knowing what you can and can't do. Suicide bombs happen the most late at night and early in the morning. And that's unfortunately the best time of day to take pictures. But you also have to know when you can't push it. So because I was there and it was, the situation was so bad, I knew I couldn't push my luck and I couldn't push and I couldn't go there that afternoon. I had to go the next day. Thankfully, I went the next day. Последний вопрос, Гулим. Многие специалисты по предотвращению насильственного экстремизма зачастую рассказывают о том, что СМИ и журналисты, рассказывая истории про то, как устроен ИГИЛ или там, что из себя представляет Бука Харам и про их преступления, тем самым больше радикализируют ситуацию ну, там, в той местности, про которую идет речь. Вопрос очень важный, потому что и наши страны как бы так или иначе связаны со всеми мировыми вещами, которые касаются насильственного экстремизма. Но вот у меня вот такой вопрос. Как рассказывать такие истории, не навредив этим людям, которые там живут? Потому что рассказывая какие-то истории, не знаю, там можно столкнуться с тем, что те же Бог Кахарам либо будут мстить местным жителям, которые рассказывали про это, и местные жители тем самым станут там меньше общаться с журналистами. Либо же мы радикализуем ту часть населения, которая придерживается тех же принципов, что ну, там, те же Бог Харам или ИГИЛ, и тем самым начнут наоборот сильнее и агрессивнее показывать свою позицию. Ну и можно ли вообще рассказывать эти истории, не навредив людям? Uh, yes, I think that we must. Uh, if we do not cover these stories, it doesn't make it better. It just makes them commit their acts of atrocity without any accountability. Uh, that being said, the safety of my subjects is my first priority, and that is far more important than any picture I will ever take. Uh, on a different trip to Nigeria, I was doing a story about some young boys who had been abducted by Boko Haram. And uh, one of them especially had a lot of information that would have been extremely valuable to the Nigerian military. And people in northern Nigeria are not just at risk from Boko Haram, they're also at risk from a, nor from a military that, is really, that uh, abuses the population. And so in this situation, we were like more concerned about the military than about Boko Haram. So we went to extreme measures to make sure that he was safe. Uh, we gave him money to take um, like a, a tricycle taxi to a place where our driver picked him up. Our driver picked him up and brought him to a hotel that, uh, where we had a room in the very back and we interviewed him and photographed him in this hotel room. I never went to his house. I never met his family. We switched hotel rooms every other day just to vary our pattern and to make sure he was safe. Uh, a lot of identifying pieces of information about him in the story were removed, again, for his safety. My pictures would have been better if I had gone to his house, undoubtedly. They would have been more moving, they would have been more emotional, you would have seen the poverty he lives in, and you would have seen his mom, and she'd be crying, and they'd be stronger pictures. That doesn't matter, because ultimately his security is more important. So that's sort of how do you keep your subjects safe, and by putting their security above your directive as a journalist. In terms of your question about how do you not contribute to radicalization, uh, the answer to that is more complicated. Uh, in northern Nigeria specifically, there's very little cell phone network and there's very little internet. So uh, most people are not seeing the work that I do. It very rarely reaches the local audience. It will reach people in Lagos and in Abuja in some of the capitals, but the likelihood of someone facing retaliation from Boko Haram because they have seen something on the internet is almost zero because Boko Haram, for the most part, are extremely uneducated. Like, they're, they're children who are kidnapped and then live in the bush, in the, like, basically in the Sahara Desert with no resources. So that's unlikely to happen. What will happen is, again, if I go to somebody's house then I draw attention to that person's family. And so that's where I have to be really careful. So I'm going to be extremely cautious about visiting people and drawing attention to them. That might make them ostracized by their community. Um, despite the fact that these children are victims of Boko Haram, there's a lot of stigma. 
So if I visit somebody's house, someone will be like, why is that foreigner there? Maybe she's giving him money, maybe she's part of an NGO, maybe he did something bad and that's why she's there. So that's an incredibly important element there. It's really different when you're talking about ISIS or another group that actually is using social media and will see the reports of journalists and ISIS interacts with journalists. Boko Haram, because they oppose Western learning, most people are illiterate, they only read the Quran and they're not using Twitter, they're not using Facebook, they're not seeing my work. So my work ha uh, happens in a very different context and can't really contribute to radicalization in the same way. What contributes to young men being radicalized in northern Nigeria is the fact that they have no other options. It's the fact that it's, it, it's an incredibly poor place with no, um, it used to be much more agricultural, but because of climate change, farmers are coming to cities in much larger numbers, and then cities become more condensed, and there's more crime, and there's more poverty. Uh, if boys and young men have nothing to do, and no opportunity in their lives, and no way to get married and start their own families, and a group comes around and offers them $5 to join a militant movement, they're gonna join the militant movement if they think that's the better option for them financially. It doesn't necessarily mean they are ideologically aligned with Boko Haram, it means they have no other options. So to fight militancy and to fight radicalization in the context of Northern Nigeria, what needs to happen is development and education and opportunities for people there. Um, so in that case, my hope is that my work can contribute to awareness of the conflict and to more funding happening and, you know, like the case of the schoolgirls, when there's pressure on the Nigerian government, they have the resources to react. Nigeria has the biggest army and the most strongest army in Africa. If they wanted to fight Boko Haram, they could. A lot of people believe that the conflict with Boko Haram continues because the government doesn't have a will to stop it, because there are a lot of people who are profiting from it and who have no desire to spend their money developing the North. So in that case, my role is to, or I see my role as a storyteller, is to tell the story of that situation and to help bring attention to that.